It is Saturday the 23rd of April and this is the Future of Photography. Yeah, coming to you from the future. Well, yeah, okay, well that sounds even better actually. So uh, yeah, well, I, hey, hey everybody, uh, I'm Adrian and you just heard uh, the dulcet tones of my co-host for this week, Jeremiah. How you doing, buddy? Good and welcome back. We've missed you for the last few weeks, but Thank uh, you. here you are, here you are and uh, and a bright new eyeball you have i do i do i do well so so this show this week folks is is going to be uh, uh hopefully a rapid fire round of lots of stuff that jeremy and i jeremiah and i are, are interested in at the moment first story up um is is my new bionic eye um so i've just had cataract surgery on one of my eyes and i am full of amazement and awe for the wonders of modern medical science right now um, which is which is crazy. I mean, long long story short, uh, as a kid, I had a, a sporting injury, got hit in the eye, uh, and uh, so I've uh, over the last couple of years, many many years later, um, I have developed a cataract, and it got to the point where I couldn't read with my right eye, so it was time to get it done, and uh, it's it's almost literally like ten minutes later. I mean, the 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 operation itself, the surgical procedure, is is very very fast obviously completely painless with anesthetics and stuff like that um and and then uh they send you home and you can see <laughs> well here's a here's a question uh how would you compare seeing before the surgery after the surgery to film grain color uh contrast Okay, to film grain color and contrast, that's interesting. So what I personally experienced with the cataract was that um, I could see colors and I could see shapes. It was just like being very short-sighted. But even when you brought something up close to your eye, you still couldn't focus. So I couldn't read with that eye at all. Um, the the initial uh, thing, um, actually, I have to refer to, to color temperature rather than to film grain. But uh, my initial reaction was that the new lens um, was full of magenta um, and blue, a very different colour. I was seeing different colours with, with separate eyes. It was very strange. My left eye seeing as normal, my right eye seeing something that was very, very magenta. And I reckon, and this is, of course, no way of measuring it, but I reckon about 1500 Kelvin cooler Mm-hmm. um it was a it wasn't the difference between you know like a daylight light bulb and a, a, a sorry um a tungsten light bulb and going out in the daylight it wasn't like that but it was sort of half half of that now in, funny enough because this was a couple of weeks ago my brain of course is rewiring itself to process the new images and actually the color balance um is, is much closer now uh, the balance of colors between the two eyes but it was a bit of a shock. Nobody told me that. As a photographer, it's a really interesting process to go through because you get all these catch lights and things like that. If you imagine like getting a little flare through the edge of a Fresnel lens or something like that, and that's exactly what it is, right? It's a it's a flare of light um, yeah, that goes through the edge of the lens that they've put in my eye. So it, it's a phenomenal experience. <laughs> well, my wife, who just oddly had cataract surgery not three or four days ago and uh, in one eye and describes it as... Basically, uh, the eye that that was now revealed with new lens is much, much brighter, much, I I think, a little contrastier. She said the blues are vivid. (laughs) Um, I mean, she was describing it almost like a saturated Kodachrome in one eye. Wow. Um, okay. But she's constantly like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I don't have an immediate need for cataract surgery, but uh, I think I won't wait quite so long before I anticipate getting it mm. so that the difference won't be so radical and my brain will be able to rewire faster. That, that's my theory. I, I think the brain is is an, an incredible thing. I mean, you know, if, if my my eyes now still see different things, so b- because of the uh, the nature of the injury that I had to my eye, um, they had to put a particular type of lens in. It's a fixed focal distance lens, and it's focusing out about two feet or sixty centimeters. So it's great for phones, reading a book, that sort of thing. It's not quite far enough for a, a computer screen, um, but the brain dials in. Um, and uh, so uh, it's 
it, 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 my brain is seeing different images. From my left eye, it's seeing the longer distance, and from my right eye, it's seeing a shorter distance. And it's learning, it's rewiring itself to learn to make sense of that. And I think, it, yeah, it, it, yeah, that, that's it, it, taken it, a couple is, of weeks. But. It's fascinating because you're doing it to your eye, the human lens. Um, and you're learning to see again, much the way we would if we walked around with a, a new camera, for example, if one would happen to have a new camera, one would start to see the world in a different way, whether it's sharper with a larger film negative or crystal clear lenses or the opposite, smudgy, gloomy, beautiful, evocative, dreamy lenses and a small grainy lens, I mean, a small grainy uh, film stock or electronic uh, applications, shall mm -hmm. we say, to, to kind of re-render how we see. And when we pick up that said camera or our human lenses and go out for a walk, we start to see different things. We start to have an appreciation of different things. So possibly why don't you take us through what it would feel like to have a brand new camera as well as brand new eye. <laughs> oh, you've done this podcasting thing before. That's an excellent segue. Thank you very much. <laughs> so here it is, of course, but we're not doing video today, sadly, because Chris isn't with us, but here is my new camera. Uh, this is something I did talk about it when I first ordered it. Um, it is called a Chroma 612. Uh, we can describe it. We it can is describe slightly, it. So, so it's, know, uh, it's smaller than your average medium format. So it's smaller than, you know, uh, a Fuji Texas Leica kind of rangefinder kind of thing. It's smaller than a Mamiya 6 or 7. Um, looks light. Um, looks very light. It is light. Well, it's 3D printed. Yeah. Um, so the body of this is 3D printed um, and uh, it is a 612 camera, as the name suggests. So you feed it medium format film and it shoots a negative up to 6 by 12. Um, it comes with masks, so you can shoot six by nine or six six as well. Um, but uh, I, for the first couple of rolls I've put through it as test rolls, of course, I wanted to go large, right? Because uh, why wouldn't you? Why buy a six twelve no. camera and shoot six <laughs> six? That would be nuts. Yeah. So, so this is uh, made by a friend of mine called Steve Lloyd, um, better known commercially as Chroma Cameras, and he's based uh, uh, just outside of Liverpool in the UK. Um, and he's made this camera for me, uh, and it's <coughs> awesome. Um, he doesn't make the lenses. Chroma cameras don't make lenses. So I have bought, I always have to take the lens cap off because I read what it says on the front of the lens. It is Schneider? a, it's a Schneider, yeah, Schneider Kreuznach, like um, uh, Super Angulon 65mm f8. So it's a large format lens, which is what gives you the ability to shoot 12 centimeters wide. Um, and uh, it has a maximum uh, aperture of f8, um, which I know to a lot of people that sound really weird when you see all these adverts for things that shoot at 1.2 and, and Noctiluxes and stuff like that. But actually for a, a, a large format lens is, is a pretty decent you know, aperture. Um, so I ha have this uh, I have this great camera. I bought this really cheapy um, uh, viewfinder to stick in one of the cold shoes off eBay. I'm slightly regretting that because it's all plastic and distorted. It's worse than looking through a Holger, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh I might, I might invest in a in a nicer viewfinder but that that gives me the opportunity then to compose right uh, a bit better because there's no viewfinder built into the camera but so far i've put two rolls through it um uh, and uh, I haven't got them back yet from the lab. They're in from the drugstore? Yeah, no, the well, they don't go to the drugstore. They, they, they go to... They actually go to a lab. They, they go to a lab. They go to and, a lab. And hopefully not an automatic processing which chops up the negative. No, 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 no. But this is a lab. That they're not, I, I, um, this, this is a lab called Silver Pan here in the UK. It's in Bristol in the UK. It's uh, run by another friend of mine called Duncan, um, and uh, he, uh, he will take good care of the film. Don't worry. Well, That's here's okay. a question on the lens part of it uh -huh. uh, i have i just coincidentally i have that very lens which i've used for uh one of my four by five cameras the obviously we we see the lens at the front the back lens is quite you know the back of the element is quite big uh, almost as big as the front element it so is, the, yeah. the the depth of that camera which doesn't look to my eye and i will represent the audience does it look, to, oh, I see, there's an extension out. So the camera body then has a little barrel and the lens attaches to the barrel and that, that allows for the spread of the 
That's right. Um, so, so for those that are not familiar, a, a, a large format lens uh, ha- will often have um, a, almost like a reverse lens on the back. So, what you think of as the as the end of a normal lens, there's actually a lens that sticks out into the camera, um, and uh, that yes, that would be very pe- perilously close to the film plane. <laughs> Um, but what the the camera has, and this is where um, this is where working with chroma cameras is great because the 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 camera body itself is a standard three D design, um, and when you specify to them what lens you're going to use with the camera, uh, they build you a, a lens cone uh, and a, a focus helicoid uh, that fits the lens that you found. So uh, yeah, I, I bought the lens. Um, from a reputable dealer here in the UK, a company called Ford's Photographic, um, who I've w- bought stuff from before, so I knew it was going to be good quality. Um, and then I uh, then at Chroma Cameras uh, designed uh, the lens cone and the helicoid all to work around that particular lens. Is um, there anything adjustable like three... on the camera? Is there anything adjustable? Uh, because uh, obviously the... you have your lens stop. Uh, there's probably a, a, a small bit of focus throw on the barrel. I'm guessing there there is. So it, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but the yeah. the, the the focus can change. So it's helpful. So it go it's helpfully marked out because you know again it come it came to me uh, when it when I got it from Chroma Cameras. They'd already uh, they'd already tested the the focal distance. For me so so you can put a ground glass in fact it ships with it i've got a little sort of a little tiny ground glass that you can put in the back of the camera if you want to use a new lens and you want to gauge what the focal distances are for new lenses and stuff so you can set it up with your yes your ground so glass. you can see it so, and steve at chroma did this for me so you can see it here here uh this this little white le- line or uh, uh, white line on the edge of the focal ring the focus ring it's got some gaps in it so the at the end it's infinity the first stop is eight feet the second stop is three feet uh and then the rest of it takes you around to the closest focusing distance which on this lens i think is about 18 inches so you're not seeing through a viewfinder to focus accurately so it's 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 a bit more than zone focus you know uh (laughs) you know it it's more like it's more like an approximate hyperfocal focus technique, yeah. really, right? So you know where you, you know you can look at a thing and go, okay, that's about eight feet away, right? I'll stick it on eight feet, or it's you know it's it's about twenty feet away, so I won't put it all the way to infinity, but I'll put it halfway between eight feet so, and infinity. You know, so if sort of you were shooting, say, at f eleven or f sixteen, you'd be pretty close to being able to you know overcome any shortfall in one's <laughs> assessment yeah, the, of distance. In, in, in my estimation of depth and. And the, the and the the gauge on the lens, yeah. So absolutely. Um, I, as I said, the first I've shot the first few rolls. The the lens goes from f eight up to f forty five. Um, so you know you you're good. Uh, you good hyper good in daylight distance. <laughs> yeah, it's good in daylight. But the good hyperfocal distance will be somewhere around f sixteen, right? So you'll get that's where you'll get enough depth of field to get to be reasonably confident on your focus. Um, and you won't be suffering any diffraction. Well, we look like forward that. of seeing some massive blow-ups uh, poster size from these. And would it be impolite to ask how much this camera set you back? Uh, no, no, not at all. Uh, the camera itself is just over three hundred pounds, mm-hmm. um, uh, and re- yeah, made to order by Crown current Crown prices three hundred dollars. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the the lens was about three hundred pounds as well. Yeah. Um, so all in all, camera and lens together, just over six hundred pounds. And it has a tripod mount, I assume. Uh, it does. It has a tripod mount. It has three little windows on the back. Depend, you know, seeing the numbers on the backing paper, depending on whether you're shooting six 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 nine or six twelve. Uh, it has two cold shoes. Um, uh, it has a little bubble level in the top of it as well. Uh, and you can wind forwards and backwards using the, fi- the film wire. Ah, so nice you can do for art exposures. purposes, yeah. uh, but uh, no Hachu mount for flash. Uh, no, no, nothing like that. No, I think the uh, you could trigger it off the lens. I bet you possibly could. There is a di- there is a, a a connection on the lens, which I'm not sure what it's for. But uh, yeah, maybe that's for investigating. Oh no, I think that was that's a bulb. Um, I think. Oh no! There's there's the shutter, and then there's the one for the uh, the, the remote little... shutter release. But there's another connector on it as well. Oh yeah, but... that could be. Uh... And then there's another thing. There's a little green thing that moves between a V and X and an M. But I don't know what that does. <laughs> <laughs> Experiment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yes. So uh, there you go. Lot to lot to have fun with there. 
Um, yes. So, so let's talk about one of the things that you've brought us. Uh, what, what should we go for? Um, we can talk about, why don't we talk about display? Sure. Um, something that I'm very, um, I'm in the, in the middle of, of trying to ascertain a good quality display unit for my house right. that would be able to be programmed for uh, digital art, NFTs, and anything else that either can connect to a blockchain or to a small thumb drive uh, or wirelessly, um, but that would present the work in absolutely beautiful rather than say screen E and I'm using quotation marks uh, right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so something that really looks dazzling um, to display, but is yet affordable. And, and oh, I have no. to say that I have not found one yet. No. Um, so, some of the most amazing displays and, you know, the, the technology that is up and coming now. Um, I know LG are working on it. Samsung in particular are working on it. Um, and there are companies that, that are kind of rising up, um, you know, either with, you know, micro LEDs that are put together, like volumetric filmmaking, um, little panels that magnetically come together. And if you step back, you can see them. I mean, if we go to any modern Apple store, usually nowadays has a massive screen there. And if you're just standing back six feet and quite close to it, and these things can be 30 feet across and 20 feet high there, and they look absolutely beautiful. Of course, if you go to a stadium, and you see some of these new display units uh, atop, whether it's uh, football or soccer, as you guys <laughs> describe. Yeah, you, you generally will see bigger and bigger television-like monitors. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, but for the house, oddly, you know, these things can cost many, many thousands of dollars, which uh, certainly is is not for the average person and there's a lot of kind of cheap ones that don't give you the hdr quality or the the kind of real guts of a of an image and so we we await those um i've put up one to explore some of them are maybe an inch thick some of them are just millimeters thick uh, that are almost fabric like and can wrap around uh, buildings, architecture, walls, and we're seeing more and more of that employed. I think as we get um, less expensive with these displays and as the quality goes up, we're going to see an in integration of photography image, image works integrated more significantly with architecture, both exterior and oh, interior. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, we is see this, this is now. The next generation of, of projection in some ways, then, because at the moment yes, you I... can project onto, uh, uh, you pr project corrected images, can't you, onto buildings and things like that? But... Yeah, um, I mean, you see this in, in uh, digital mapping mm -hmm. or photographic mapping, and, and there's kind of consumer or prosumer uh, tools that avail oneself of, of, of being able to take what is uh, a, a basically a 3D uh, image, a LIDAR image effectively of, of the front of a building, map it correctly and then project uh, an image onto that very, very building. And one could kind of play with that on one's computer or just project uh, an image directly on that to great effect. And, and um, there are artists and uh, architects now working with those kinds of things, there are groups uh, all over the world in Tokyo, Montreal, and um, Paris that, that are working uh, closely um, with architects and environmental experiential organizations to create really amazing kind of um, you are there into what transforms a simple 2D image into a complete experience. Um, when we start to see these moving into walls of a building, uh, facades of a building. Um, I think we're gonna be 
really kind of pleasantly surprised at what starts to happen. I mean, you could imagine an architect building a skyscraper that whose exterior walls create a kind of invisibility cloak to the mm. actual building or mirror the background uh, yeah, yeah, of it so that it just blends beautifully. It's sort of uh, a, a Frank Lloyd Wright concept of integration with the environment into a kind of a massive way, but using imagery taken from the actual, um, the actual environment in which these buildings uh, are placed. And obviously on the flip side to do something really zany and, and, and bold and graphic to redefine it. So, so when so you say you're looking that, for one of these things for your house, so you mean you you mean the outside of your house? Do you? No, no, no. I'm not. <laughs> I'm just look, looking for a nice uh, frame, you know, probably about you know thirty by twenty um, vertical because that's the space I need uh, to present. And you know, yes, you could buy a frame TV and whatnot, but nothing purpose built for it that I've seen that is in the kind of uh, realm of what I would consider. Uh, I see, I would think uh, three or four times a matted frame, a, a high quality matted frame of a still image um, would be the price point that I think would really uh, okay. uh, make sense. Okay. You know, I mean, one certainly doesn't want to spend, you know, 10,000 pounds on it. No, no, no. But you've, you've given us a link spend. here, haven't you, as well, though, to a... That's a, a, that's a, a company that makes displays, and uh, it just shows you where product. we're going. Yeah, so the, the, the branding is called Mural, but it's, they seem to be owned by Netgear, or at least offered by yeah. Netgear. And they're charging some hundreds of dollars rather than many thousands of dollars. It'd be interesting to see one of these things. I wonder if... Um, I wonder if there is anywhere, maybe I can look up in London, see if there's anywhere I can go and see some of these things, you know, because um, a lot yeah. of it is, yeah, they, they, of course they look great in the marketing. Um, um, yeah, because they I, just... I, I'd, 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 like, I'd like to have one of these, I think, if the technology is maturing to that point. And I think that there's an th element of it as well, which is that the extent to which you shoot for the f you shoot for the presentation medium, don't you? Yeah. And I yes. think that's you know if we if we suddenly I mean we do talk every now and again, don't we, about the future of presentation and things like yeah. that. And I think um, you know uh, I, I'd like to, to to have that as sort of yeah, uh, image pipeline, as it were, um, and sit and to play with something some stuff. It, like it's that. a funny thing that you bring that up because I have resisted uh, vertical framing. I would say almost my whole life as an instinct, not as an aesthetic judgment, but as an instinct, I always like the horizon line to be wide. I like the, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, I, I just see the world in, in that way. It's more traditional. It's, it's probably more cultural uh, than anything else. Um, so my framing normally when I look at something, my instinct is always, you know, two to one, two yeah, through yeah. five, wh whatever it is, it's that. But um, with my... Um, Involvement in, in in digital art and NFTs and 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 the kind of process of uh, of display and the limitations of display generally now sixteen by nine on a screen, um, I I'm starting to warm to vertical composition. And what's interesting, interesting is now I I find myself composing specifically for the output rather than composing for the image. This is when I'm working in a certain realm. Yeah. That's a very new thing for me, and I've been doing photography for a long time. That's interesting. That's it. So, so I should tell you then that the, my new camera that I, I've been just been talking about, I've, sh I've shot several frames vertically. So that's a two to one ratio, but vertically rather than yeah. horizontally. I, for me, I, I'm, I, I'm a bit like you, what you've desc described. I do like a, a wider aspect ratio for, for my composition. But I find actually that I, as I get more into those, that, those wider aspect ratios over the years, I've actually found I enjoy them just as much vertically 
uh, you know a skinny tall image right yeah, yeah. um yeah as as i do so so for me i think it is the, it's the aspect ratio that it rather than you know just saying it's cinematic or it's panoramic or you know whatever you want to call you know the, all those buzzwords that people use these days. sure but you know in a camera you know even even in a you know six by six frame one has the opportunity of finding an image or you know, discovering an image, taking an image, recomposing it later, or knowing that you're going to be using a part of it. Um, so the restrictions on your composition are just in your imagination, I would say, with most, most cameras. But when you start thinking about, I'm going to take an image and I want it displayed by two to one or you know, 16 by nine, which is our iPhone, um, vertically, you start to look at the world specifically with those limitations so that you max out your composition for how it will be seen, not the other way around, which is here's my composition. How can I frame it on paper? Yes. In other words, if I have here's an image and it's three to two, and I like it, I can mat it, and I can frame it, and I can present it just the way I want. Now there is a, quote, restriction, whether it's the the TikTok restriction or the you know, <laughs> the iPhone. And there's a, there is, a I, I think, a discussion to be had, um, much deeper discussion that we'll have today, of the iPhone's influence on cultural composition and aesthetic oh okay let's save that for, for another day because this is yeah, supposed to that's be a our big, quick, that's this a is supposed to be our quick discussion. fire discussion that sounds like it's <laughs> worth, worthy of di diving deeper into yeah um and i'm gonna i'm gonna completely counter that because as you can tell i'm on a bit of an analog photography kick this sure. year so so my next up um is an event actually um uh so in a few weeks time on saturday the 14th of may uh, i am going to an event called the analog spotlight uh, and this is an event being hosted by uh, a group of people, um, you know, entrepreneurs and creatives in the analog photography industry, for want of a better term, here in the UK. Uh, it's in Worcester in the UK. And uh, there is going to be all sorts of fun analog photography uh, stuff here. And at this, that it's just a one day thing um, and it's going to be great fun. Uh, just uh, a selection of things uh, that's going to be there. Uh, there's going to be exhibitors from various different companies. Uh, I, th uh, the, I think there's, there's um, you know, Steve from from Cromer who built the camera I was just talking about. He's going to be there. There's going to be labs there. There's going to be people that, that build and, cre and create things, you know, people that are bringing new films to market, that sort of thing. And there's going to be some talks uh, and demos uh, uh, of, of analog photography. Uh, I think we've got... Um, we've got a, a chap called Andy Church from Kodak Alaris uh, who is uh, to, coming to talk. There's uh, somebody from Ilford coming to talk as well. So we've got like film manufacturers coming to be there. Um, the like I say, camera manufacturers, uh, labs, all sorts of things going on there. And um, there'll even be opportunities to develop your own film uh, with, with some expert guidance. Uh, you know, there's all there's uh, all sorts of stuff uh, that's going on, and it's going to be a good day. There's even a photo walk, um, which I was told the other day that I need to host, which is a bit of an odd one because I don't really know the city of Worcester very well. <laughs> All the better. All the better. You'll be, it's going, you'll it's be going discovering to be more, of a photo, it. more of a photo ramble than a photo walk, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, just wanted to, to bring that up, flag that up, because it's going to be a really good, fun event uh, on Saturday, the 14th of May. Link in the show notes. Well, that's interesting. I have one other thing to add, which is the complete antithesis of the display issues that I discussed earlier. <laughs> and this is about printing photo books on newsprint inexpensively and large. Um, th there is so a, a site. Printing your, printing your own newspaper, essentially. Effectively, yeah. Oh, Newsprint-photobook.org is, is the um, URL. And, and this is a way to kind of see one's image in a different, in a, in a different format, less precious, shall we say, yeah, and, good point. Yeah, and 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 
uh, and inexpensive as well. And um, uh, you know, I'm I'm about to embark on a a little journey of printing a broadsheet, effectively, Broad of nice. images that I think will be appropriate for newsprint. I.e., it will be black and white, or in that case, probably gray and lighter gray. Yeah. Um, but integrating that in, in a body of work that I did um, last year. Um, That's actually interesting. You have to send me one. I really, I'd really like to, to receive one of those. That'd be great. I, th I think that it, it's a lot of fun. And, and also there's the, you know, one could print these and then bind them very beautifully with Japanese binding and, a, and just to create something a little bit different. Um, and so presentation is something that's always on my mind because I, I tend to shoot a lot. And when I'm kind of involved in a film project, I don't output as much. I just kind of take a lot of pictures. I'll post, you know, a few times a week on Instagram. Uh, or Twitter and uh, and or Twitter, um, but I won't be focused on a body of work printed the way I like it. Um, you know, I'm, so I'm fascinated by you know general approaches to outputting, whether it's high quality, call it uh, digital output, whether it's newsprint, and um, and you know one of the last recommendations I have is a uh, publisher called Nazareli. Um, Nazareli Press, I, I highly, highly uh, recommend that our listeners, viewers, uh, check it out. They have a very specific point of view. They also make great uh, olive oil. Um, they're out of California. Uh, Chris Pitchler, who, who runs it with his wife, Maya, they are fabulous people. I know them well. And they, they do have a um, a series of books, which they, I think it's mainly 12 pages at the most, maybe eight. Okay. So they're thematically cohesive and you subscribe to them and they're, they're, uh, they're interesting and they do monographs, etc. cetera. And uh, they're very passionate. They've been doing it a long time and they are a, uh, a publisher uh, well worth investigating if you are in that world. Ah, so, interesting. So are these, are these the people that print the newspapers? As no, well? no, they're that's, totally that's different. different. They do very high quality print. So the so the the newspaper print link because you put a link in the show notes for that as well, didn't you? Which is um, which is uh, to a blog, I think, that newsprint photo book blog. Yes. Is that yeah. the the people that would actually print these newspapers? Yeah, yeah. I think there or there's links to it. Um, cool okay all right well i tell you what so if that's your pick of the week i will go to my pick of the week um which is one more thing which is actually a kickstarter uh, as well as a product um but this is a thing called the solar cam puck so you may well have heard me talk about solar can in the past um it's uh, and you've got so yeah you've got some <laughs> i've got some on my shelf as well for those that don't know solar can the idea behind solar can is you get something that looks like a beer can but inside um is a piece of light sensitive photo paper and you would make exposures you would you, you put your can somewhere and you'd leave it to make exposures uh, over the course of you know three six twelve months if you want to and you get these amazing images of the path of the sun and and how that changes through the year and um, this the puck is really interesting it's called the puck because it's sort of puck shaped uh, and sized or for those of us that don't live in hockey playing countries it looks like a tin of shoe polish um, and inside is again a, a a piece of light sensitive paper but this time it is um, it is designed to make an exposure just within a few hours or the course of a single day. Mm. So you, the, the, the idea being, of course, that you don't, you know, it's a bit more, this is, I guess this is the solar can version of instant photography, right? It doesn't take six months to come out. It takes just a day to do, um, uh, of course, very tiny pinhole in the puck and the pet and, and the image is, is uh, exposed on the paper. Uh, and there's a Kickstarter for that. So I'll put a link in the uh, show notes, um, because it, it'd be a really interesting product um, and I think it could be a lot of fun for people and for those people who maybe were less keen about the solar can 
because it is perhaps uh, a long time, a big investment of time, um, uh, and maybe yeah, not instant gratification, um, then maybe this is something that uh, would be of interest. Okay, cool. Is that, I think, are we done then, are we? We, haven't, we, sort, done. Of whistled, we sort of whistled through that, haven't we? As I'm yes, looking at we my have. recording, we've done 30 odd minutes or something like that. So uh, I think, uh, well, there we go. Um, good to talk. Good to see. It's good to be back on the podcast. I feel like I've been away a lot recently. So you have, you have, and uh, I've been kind of towing a line here, um, and, and <laughs> happily so. Uh, will be I will be off next week as I'm traveling on Saturday. But, well, I think um, you've probably earned a week off because you've been the anchor <laughs> for the last two or three months, haven't you? I, I, I hope so. Which is surprising given I've been in production and Indeed. away, and you know, but uh, managed to keep this. Uh, rolling. And, well, thank uh, you for it. anchoring the show uh, while Chris and I have been <laughs> flitting around and letting life get in the way of everything. Um, okay. uh, and we'll, uh, I hope, uh, yes, uh, well, we'll sit, we'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks, I guess, if very you're traveling next week. Um, but thank you very much. Lo- lovely to talk to everybody. Nice to be back. And we will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye all.